Hi, so today I share my experience on how I got onto a professional doctorate in counselling psychology. It's a PhD level degree that counsellors can do to become counselling psychologists in the UK. This is going to be quite UK specific because that's the only system I have experience in. I did get a place this year, so I'll be starting in October 2023. I thought it would be helpful for me to share stuff that I wish I knew whilst I was applying in a few videos. So for this one, we're actually going to talk about what it's like to apply for it and hopefully what it takes to get on it. In my experience, I hope it helps some of you who are hoping to do the same. First of all, a caveat is that I'm coming in from a different career. So I've already worked for over 10 years in a commercial setting, so in business, and now I'm going into psychology. I always wanted to do it, but I'm glad I kind of waited this long for a few other reasons. But just to say that this was not a direct, straight out of university type journey. I did apply for it at the age of 33 and got on the first time that I applied. So hopefully this relates specifically to those people, but I'm sure it will be helpful to anyone who's thinking about applying for this kind of course. First of all, what's a professional doctorate? Most people will know it as a PhD. A professional doctorate in the UK means that you're not just doing research. So PhD is Doctor of Philosophy. So you might think of that as more theoretical or research-based based on the name. So you're a doctor of philosophy. Philosophy is love of knowledge. So it's much more on the research side. Whereas a professional doctorate is still a doctorate. You still get the doctor title if you complete it, but it's a professional doctorate, meaning that you have to actually work in the profession whilst you're doing that degree and do the research. The foundational difference between PhD and professional doctorate is that there is no practical experience in a PhD. And in a professional doctorate, it's based on having the actual placement as well as doing the research. Now, a few other differences, and we could make a whole video on each of these differences, and maybe I will if I see interest. The other thing is professional doctorates tend not to have as much funding as PhDs. I'm not sure exactly why this is. The bodies that fund PhDs have certain areas of interest, and they really want the research to support kind of their investments, right? So a professional doctorate being much more about developing the individual and equipping them to do a job uh, maybe is less of interest because the, the offering is split. So there are some difficulties to doing a professional doctorate over a PhD, I would say, but I found, and I did look at doing PhDs, I did have a supervisor during my master's who asked if I wanted to do a PhD with her. And I you know, thought about it, I did put some research proposals together for that, but I quickly realized that I didn't want to do any of them. And this was this course that I'm about to do is the only one I really wanted to do. So anyway, if you're on that same journey, this video will give you some insight as to what it was like. Just to let you know which university I applied to and got onto, it's City, University of London. So my insights will be slanted, particularly to City. And if you're applying there, this will help. So the first thing is, what do you have to do for the application? So there, for City, there are three components that you have to submit as part of your online application. So the first one is a research proposal. So a research proposal is a quite a light pass at what you would aim your research around. Now I say light pass because actually fleshing out a research proposal at doctorate level is very involved and they're not going to expect you to have an absolutely comprehensive research proposal before you've even got onto the course because they're going to teach you a lot about how those research methods work. But they are looking for your understanding on how research methods work and how you're going to apply them to your area of interest. So for me, I'm looking at limerence. So I was looking at what limerence is, what research was there at the time of writing, what was missing, which is quite a lot because it's not a standardized or particularly acknowledged condition. So I was really looking at my experience so far, what I've learned about working with clients with limerence and how I thought I would start to shape research in that area. So for this, you probably just want to look at what kind of topics you're interested in, what would you be willing to research for at least two and a half years? Well, two years at least, uh, but possibly more. Um, the course is three years, by the way, but in the first year, you don't really have to start your research. So I understand. Um, 
and then your research methods. So how are you going to actually study the thing that you're interested in? So you might go for more qualitative, so that is more descriptive, quality, so it's like going into depth kind of thing. And then there's quantitative, so quantity uh, amounts. It's about statistics and inferences from larger numbers of data, standardization, that kind of thing. Depending on your interest, you should look into which methods you would be applying to your topic, what your topic's about and why you're interested in it, and which questions are left unanswered, which you wanna do research in. So that's your research project. Personal statement. Personal statement is what it sounds like if you've applied to university before, similar to a, a personal statement for a job, except you gotta make it more about why you wanna be on the course. So for this, what history is relevant to you uh, to apply this to this course? Um, for me, my counseling, so being a counselor, I've only done for a year also, but I did have several other experiences that were caring roles. So I was working with people who were vulnerable or needed support in some way, uh, and that started quite early. So I worked with people with autism, children with autism. I worked with people with disabilities who had learning disabilities or mental or physical disabilities and needed support at university. Um, and I also worked with a charity that did work with teenagers from underprivileged backgrounds in London and sort of coaching them through a project. Um, and so these all really fed in. So I put all of that in and then I also put in what I understood to be important in terms of being a counsellor. Why did I come to this profession? Why do I know that this is right for me? And why have I chosen City? Now these answers will be specific to you, so you really should make it tailored. If there's any one thing that I would say about writing these applications is make it very tailored to you. And I mean, don't copy what other people have said and said, oh, this person said this, so I'm just gonna use it and reword it a little bit. Authenticity comes through strongly. So if you are showing the true reason and you really do want to study counseling psychology at doctorate level, that should come out in your writing. If you have trouble with writing, that's another thing and you can tackle that in other ways. In terms of the content, things that you consider significant to put into that application, that should be driven by you. Right, so I put those experiences in, then the counselling. How did I know counselling was right for me? So for me, it was even after the first session I had with a client, I got, you know, there was a, a specific feeling that I had afterwards, which I describe, um, and I actually described that in an interview, and that feeling was kind of my guiding, you know, my North Star. So I knew, like, my body and my mind were telling me, you've really found something here. And so that very, that's a personal experience that I had. And maybe you didn't feel it right away. Maybe it took a few months after you got the techniques and you started to see people responding, clients responding, that kind of thing. Um, just make it real to you. So there's that, that's a personal statement. The final piece is the service user involvement strategy. So this complements the research element. Remember, we talked about professional doctorates being research and practical. In your research proposal is about the research and the methods, but the service user involvement strategy is how much you understand about mental health services in the UK and how somebody with a condition or in a situation related to your research will benefit from your research. So for me, I was talking about what kinds of charities or what kind of uh, interfaces people with limerence or love sick, let's say, issues uh, would go to in order to seek help. Where would they find support and how can we tap into that and either provide more support or use the findings to give practitioners insights on how to handle those kinds of situations and support people with limerence. And for you, that's going to be whatever you are researching on. Is it children? Is it people with addiction, binge eating, whatever it is? that is specific to your research project. So I was showing, I know this demographic of people, what issue they're facing, and I'm gonna design research to help them and help practitioners who work with them. But then also, how is that actually going to play out in the real world? How is it gonna help them and how does it get to them? That's where the service user involvement strategy comes in. It really shows how your research findings are going to relate to the real world and help people. So that's the practical, like, application what you have to write before getting an interview uh, if you get offered one so once you get offered an interview at least for city this is a split interview so one is a, a group interview and then one is a personal interview so the group interview lasts not that long maybe like 20 minutes of discussion between you and the people 
uh, in your group. For me, it was, yeah, 10 or 12 people. And they gave us a case, basically. So somebody who came for help, who was seeking help from a counselor, therapist, um, within a school setting, our specific example. Uh, I maybe won't go into detail in this video, maybe in another one of what the case was, but I'll give you kind of the structure of what they gave us. And I think what they were asking from us in that group setting. So what they gave us was the person's background, you know, their age, uh, what kind of family situation they were in, phase of life, what was important to them, it seems like looking from an outsider, what seemed to be going on and what did this person mention was trouble, troubling for them. They had anxiety or they were bullied, etc. But then some other clues as to where things could be going wrong in other areas of their life. And your goal is not to so much interpret them and say, oh, it's probably because of bullying, but actually I think the problem is this. You can hypothesize and say, okay, if this person came in, how can we support them? What would we inquire about? What, how would we get more information to see if we can help them in a more holistic way? You have that discussion with your peers. So the other 11 people there. Um, a tip for that is one, you, they're looking for someone who is collaborative. So you don't talk over people. You don't try overly to sound like the most smart, the one that has you know the most to say, like to impress people in that sense. They're looking for empathy. They're looking for someone who listens, who is open-minded, who wants the opinion of their peers and takes them in. So you're not just waiting for yourself to speak. You're actually waiting for their, their point, taking it in, thinking about it, and then coming back and say, you know what, I agree with you. And I, I would just also take from that, etc. Or actually, I think I understand your position, but I, I think I slightly disagree because of this reason. You present yourself, but you have to appear professional. Like this is some, you, you're going to become a, counseling psychologist. So you need to work in a team at some point. You need to work with other peers uh, in the same field. And they wanna see that you're gonna be someone suitable for that. You can actually be in a room of people who do the same job as you and treat them with respect, really take their opinion on and bring your own insights, bring your own uh, assessments of what's happening. After that, you'll be taken to an individual interview. Um, and for that, they're looking for your personal motivations, what brings you here. And of course, your personal statement is going to have a lot of that. For me, the people who interviewed me on the individual interview were not the same people who reviewed my personal statement. So don't assume that they know everything from the documents that you submitted to get an interview. Assume the interview is starting from fresh because they kind of come at it from different angles. The people who met you in person, the people who saw your application, I knew the people interviewing me did not see my research project. So I'm introducing myself as well. So you bring up the most important things. Like for me, it was, I think it was five, 40 minutes in my individual interview. And that went very quickly. And they'll ask you the usual things like why counseling psychology, maybe why counseling and not clinical psychology, which I had a big reasoning for. Um, uh, what are you looking forward to? What is, what do you think is going to be most difficult about the course? Um, one curveball that I'll share was that they asked uh, how they thought they asked. One curveball for me was that they asked how they thought counseling psychologists should be involved in social justice movements. And that I had did not see that one coming. So I had to really think on the fly. Um, and the rest was really just what brings you here? We want to see the real passion. OK, so. Try and avoid, you know, generics. Show the real thing. Show like, I know it. I feel it. I understand this is a true dream of mine. And I'm so excited for this to be my next step. But the other thing also is that they asked, which is important. So they asked why become a counselling psychologist and not just a counsellor. There are a lot of different ways to get that accreditation in the UK. So you can be a counsellor in many different ways. And that's a that's a huge topic. So we won't go into that. Why did you choose counselling psychology at doctorate level at university specifically? Because it's a big engagement. I think this should be a guiding principle if you're wondering, should I just be a counsellor, probably be quicker and cheaper? Or do I want to be a counselling psychologist? One of the big distinctions is a counselling psychologist can do research, is equipped to do research from the get-go once they've completed the doctorate um, and you're really engaging in the community of counseling psychology so a counselor is you know able to see clients applies the theories you know is a is, is a practitioner um, but a counseling psychologist is a researcher practitioner so they 
They are doing both. They are consuming the research, they are engaging by providing research, and they are a practitioner. So they are working directly with people. So for me, that was that was the big distinction. That's what I highlighted as my understanding of why someone would do the professional doctorate. Um, so I'll stop there. Already a pretty long video for me. Um, if you have more questions on counselling psychology, what it means to get uh, accredited in the UK, etc., leave a comment. Obviously, like and subscribe. I have to say, I have to say it. Sorry about it. Um, and stick around. Hopefully, see a few more of you here. It'd be nice to see more people who want to get into the industry. Um, and hopefully, we can learn from the whole thing together. Cool. Take care of yourself.